OK, so we're going to evaluate this double series. And our first step is just going to be to explore what we can do to simplify within this fraction. So for example, we could start by dividing through by m squared and n squared, which will simplify the numerator a little bit. So this will give us, we've got the same double sum, so we won't write the m equals 1 to infinity again. But we're now going to have the numerator is m squared. And the num denominator, if we're dividing through by m squared and n squared, we've got now 1 over n squared times 2 to the m plus n. And then our second term, we've divided through by m squared and n squared, so we've got 1 over m squared times 4 to the m. But we could actually write 4 to the m as 2 to the m times 2 to the m, because 4 is 2 times 2, just using our laws of indices. And then we see we can do something similar here, 2 to the m plus n is the same as having 2 to the m times 2 to the n. And if we do that, we see that some common factors emerge here. So we've got a common factor of 2 to the m in the denominator here, which is quite nice. And then we get a term that just has n, and this term just has m in it. So we can rewrite this whole sum then as the double sum of, we've got m squared in the numerator still, and then taking out this factor of 2 to the m, we get 1 over n squared times 2 to the n plus 1 over m squared times 2 to the m. And you can see here we've actually got something similar on the outside as well. If we were to divide through by m squared on the top and bottom now, we'd actually get the same looking piece. So we'd have 1 over, we've got 1 over m squared times 2 to the m. And then in this bracket here, if we write these in alphabetical order as well, just to make it a bit nicer, we've got 1 over m squared 2 to the m plus 1 over n squared 2 to the n. So there's some nice interesting kind of symmetry here. And just to make this a little bit nicer to work with, we'll introduce a shorthand. So we'll say that xm is going to denote this term the 1 over m squared times 2 to the m. And similarly for xn, this is going to be the same just with n in place of m. So this gives us something that's a little bit nicer to work with. So we can rewrite this whole quite daunting looking double sum now as something where we've got the sum from m and n 1 up to infinity. And we can just express all of this now as 1 over xm times xm plus xn. And now we'll see if we can exploit some of the symmetry here, that the xm and xn terms are effectively the same as each other. So the first thing we can try is actually swapping the order of summation here, which technically we ought to check that this does indeed converge for us to be able to do that. So we'll just assume, for the sake of solving this problem, we'll assume that it is valid to swap the order of summation. But this is something, if you're interested, you could try and show more rigorously, more carefully. So we can rewrite all of this, and all we've changed is just the order in which we're summing these, so we sum the m terms before summing the n terms. But then at this point, we could actually just swap the letters. So we could swap, because the m and n are both just labels, so we could actually swap and replace each n by an m, and vice versa, replace the m's by n's, which we'll write this out just so it's a bit less confusing. So we can now rewrite this as the sum from m equals 1 to infinity, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity. So we're literally just reallocating these labels so we've now got 1 over xn times xn plus xm, like this, just swapping the role of m and n. And you can see that where we've got the sum from m equals 1 and then the sum from n equals 1 to infinity, we've got a fraction with xm here, and now we've got a fraction with xn. And it could be interesting to see what happens if we actually add these two together. So if we write this, let's say that the original series is called s, then adding these two together we've got two lots of s, so 2 times s is going to be our double sum starting with m and then going to n up to infinity. We've now got this original fraction, so 1 over xm times xm plus xn plus this other fraction 1 over xn times xn plus xm. So I'll just write these in alphabetical order, xm plus xn. Then you can see here we could add these two together, just multiply on the top and bottom here by xn. So again we'd multiply by an xn there, and here we'd multiply by an xm to make the denominators the same. So then we can rewrite this whole double sum as it's going to be the double sum of we've got xn plus xm, or if we write these in alphabetical order, xm plus xn over this common denominator now 
of xm times xn times this sum xm plus xn. And you can see here the numerator xm plus xn just cancels in the denominator, which is really nice. And now we've got a much more workable double sum. So we can rewrite this whole double sum as we've just got the sum of 1 over xm times 1 over xn, which is really, really nice to work with now. So if we write it, splitting it up into two separate fractions, 1 over xm times 1 over xn, so we've got the sum over m first, then the sum over n. And you can see here that the 1 over xm terms don't depend on n anymore, so we can think of this as a constant and actually just take that out as a factor of our sum over n. So the sum over n, we don't actually need the xm terms. We can take this out and rewrite the whole double sum now as it's the sum from m equals 1 to infinity of 1 over xm times the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over xn. And you can see here this whole sum we could evaluate and this becomes a constant we could effectively take out of the original sum with m. We could actually just multiply these two together at this point. We could consider these two sums entirely separately of each other because we've got this product xm, xn, where they don't depend on each other. And if you remember that xm and xn are effectively the same thing, just with a different letter, then you'll see that this sum on the left here and this sum on the right, these are actually just the same thing. So we can rewrite all of this just using a single variable. We could write this the sum from n equals 1 up to infinity of 1 over xn, then we could put this in brackets, and that's just all squared, which is really, really nice to work with. And then remembering that xn is 2 to the n over n squared, then we can write its reciprocal is going to be n squared over 2 to the n. So we've now got this double sum as actually just the square of a single sum with a single variable, or at least two times our double sum, so we divide by 2 later. This is a much more workable format now for us. And now using a little bit of algebraic trickery, we can evaluate this inner sum quite easily now. So we'll start with the result, you probably know this, for the sum of a geometric series, that if we have x to the n, sum of this from 0 to infinity, this is just equal to 1 over 1 minus x, at least if x is between positive and negative 1. And then we're going to build from this result into n squared over 2 to the n, by differentiating on both sides, first of all. So if we differentiate on both sides, again, differentiating term by term in a series like this, we ought to be a bit more rigorous and check that this converges in the right way before we do this. So you can look into the more detail if you're interested, but we'll just assume again that we're able to do this for the sake of solving the problem at hand. So differentiating term by term on the left-hand side gives us the sum from n equals zero to infinity of n times x to the power of n minus 1. Then on the right-hand side, differentiating this, for example, using the chain rule, we're going to get 1 over 1 minus x all squared. And then you can see here we've got x to the n minus 1. So if we were to differentiate this again, instead of getting an n squared term, we get n times n minus 1. But quite a nice way of dealing with this is just multiplying by x on both sides here. So if we multiply by x on both sides, this turns into an x to the n, and we can just replace this one by an x. And then we're ready to differentiate with respect to x again on both sides. So again, under some assumptions that this is actually valid to differentiate term by term, we're going to now get on the left-hand side, we get the sum from n equals 0 up to infinity of n squared times x to the n minus 1. You'll notice that actually the 0 term where n is 0, we've just got 0 times x to the n minus 1. So we may as well get rid of that and we can write this as the sum from n equals 1 up to infinity. So you can see this is really starting to look like our inner sum that we're interested in. And differentiating this term, which you could do for example using the quotient rule, we're going to get 1 plus x divided by 1 minus x all cubed. And again, because we've got x to the n minus 1, we want to have 2 to the n, so we could again just multiply by x on both sides. So this turns into x to the n, then we've got this factor of x here. So then we could just set x equal to a half, and this is valid because this is between 1 and negative 1, with our previous starting point there. And you can see that we're actually going to get this original sum on the left-hand side. So we've got our original sum from n equals 1 to infinity of n squared over 2 to the n, so the x to the n just becomes 1 over 
2 to the n. So then we can start to evaluate this. We get a half times 1 plus a half divided by 1 minus a half all cubed. Then the numerator, we've got a half times 3 over 2. So we get 3 quarters divided by a half cubed, so divided by an eighth. So 3 quarters divided by an eighth gives us the number 6. So this entire term here is just the number 6. So then we've got 2s is equal to 6 squared, so then s is equal to our original sum is a half times 6 squared. So a half of 36 gives us 18 as our value for the original double sum, which I think is a really satisfying answer there, even if we did gloss over some of the details like differentiating term by term and exchanging the order of summation earlier.